For nearly three decades, the Berlin Wall stood as the most visible symbol of the Cold War, a physical and ideological barrier dividing not just the city of Berlin, but the entire world. Built overnight in 1961, the wall was intended to halt the flood of defectors fleeing communist East Germany for the democratic West. Yet, it became much more than that. It became a representation of oppression, the division of families, and the broader struggle between freedom and authoritarianism. And in 1989, that barrier came crashing down in a wave of joy, protest, and a little bit of confusion. But how did we get there? In this video, we'll explore the rise and fall of the Berlin Wall, how it was built, the life it created for those living in its shadow, and the dramatic events of 1989 that led to its sudden collapse. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and these are chapters of history. To understand the fall of the Berlin Wall, we first need to understand why it was built. After World War II, Germany was divided into four occupation zones, controlled by the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and the Soviet Union. Berlin, the capital, was also divided, though it was deep within the Soviet-controlled East. As the Cold War tensions grew, Berlin became the focal point of a larger ideological battle between East and West. By 1949, two German states had emerged, the Federal Republic of Germany or West Germany and the German Democratic Republic or East Germany. In the years leading up to the construction of the wall, over 3 million East Germans fled to the West, seeking freedom and better economic opportunities. For the communist regime in East Germany, this brain drain was unsustainable. So, in August 1961, the Berlin Wall was erected overnight, catching the world by surprise. Life on either side of the wall couldn't have been more different. In West Berlin, people enjoyed freedom, prosperity, and a thriving cultural scene, while East Berliners lived under a repressive regime with severe restrictions on travel, speech, and everyday life. The wall didn't just divide a city, it separated families, friends, and loved ones. Thousands of East Berliners made dangerous and desperate attempts to cross the wall, risking imprisonment and sometimes their lives. Despite the ever-present threat of the Stasi, the East German secret police, many still attempted to escape. Some tunneled their way to freedom, others made daring jumps from windows or flew over in homemade contraptions. By the mid-1980s, the political landscape was beginning to change. In the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and introduced radical reforms aimed at revitalizing the crumbling Soviet system. Their economy was stagnating, and the cost of maintaining control over Eastern Europe's communist regimes was becoming unsustainable. Gorbachev understood that the Soviet Union could no longer afford to suppress dissent through military intervention, as it had done in Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. His policies of glasnost, which promoted more openness, and perestroika, an effort at restructuring the failing economy, were meant to promote more freedom within the Soviet bloc. But these reforms had unintended consequences. Across Eastern Europe, people interpreted them as permissions to push for more political freedoms and even independence from Soviet control. In Poland, the Solidarity Movement gained momentum, while Hungary made the bold move to open its borders with Austria, the first breach in the Iron Curtain. As tens of thousands of East Germans traveled to Hungary and then crossed into Austria, it became clear that the tide was turning. These developments signaled to the people of East Germany that change was possible, sparking waves of protests across the country. But for East Germany's hardline leadership, led by Eric Honecker, there was little appetite for reform. In October 1989, Gorbachev visited East Germany for the 40th anniversary of the founding of the German Democratic Republic. What was meant to be a celebration of communist power turned into an embarrassment for the East German regime. 
Thousands of protesters flooded the streets, demanding reform and cheering for Gorbachev rather than their own leaders. During his visit, Gorbachev made it clear that the Soviet Union would not intervene militarily to support the East German government. Honecker, who had once been confident in the Soviet Union's backing, now found himself isolated. With Gorbachev's refusal to support military intervention, the people of East Germany took to the streets. In the city of Leipzig, weekly protests, known as the Monday demonstrations, grew in size throughout the summer and fall of 1989. By October, over 70,000 people were marching demanding freedom of speech, the right to travel, and political reform. The government, which had previously responded with repression and violence, was now unsure how to react. As the protests spread to other cities, the East German leadership became increasingly divided. Erich Honecker, a staunch communist, wanted to use force to crush the demonstrations, but others in the Politburo feared a violent crackdown would only worsen the situation. By mid-October, Honecker's grip on power had weakened significantly. Facing pressure from within his own government, and the growing unrest on the streets, Honecker was forced to resign on October 18, 1989. He was replaced by Egon Krenz, which promised reforms, but it was too little too late. Egon Krenz's appointment did little to stem the tide of protest. East Germans had seen the reforms happening in neighboring countries, and they wanted more than just empty promises, they wanted action. Across the country, the protests grew in size and intensity, with demonstrators openly calling for the resignation of the communist government. In response to the growing pressure, Krenz's government made a critical decision to relax travel restrictions between East and West Germany. On November 9, 1989, a press conference was held to announce the changes, but what happened next was nothing short of a chaotic mess. The announcement of the new travel policy was supposed to be a carefully managed change, allowing East Germans to apply for visas to travel to the West under more relaxed conditions. But at the press conference on November 9th, Gunter Schabowski, a member of the Politburo, fumbled the message. When asked when the new regulations would take effect, he mistakenly said, immediately, without delay, suggesting that the border was open right away. This miscommunication set off a chain reaction. Within minutes of Schabowski's announcement, news spread like wildfire. East Berliners, who had been waiting for this moment for decades, began to gather at the wall's border checkpoints. By nightfall, thousands of people had flooded the streets demanding that the gates be opened. Caught completely off guard, the border guards were confused and unsure of what to do. The official orders hadn't arrived yet, but the sheer number of people at the gates made it impossible to stop them. Finally, overwhelmed and without clear direction, the guards did the unthinkable. They opened the gates. The scene that followed was one of euphoria and disbelief. East Berliners poured through the gates, reuniting with friends and family in the West. People celebrated atop the wall, tearing it down piece by piece, a powerful symbol of freedom after decades of division. What had been one of the most fortified and fearsome borders in the world had fallen not with violence, but with jubilation. The Berlin Wall, a symbol of Cold War division, was now crumbling before the eyes of the world. The fall of the Berlin Wall was just the beginning. In the days that followed, the streets of Berlin were filled with celebrations and people from East and West came together to dismantle the wall piece by piece. For many, it was a moment of liberation the end of a long nightmare that had separated them from the world and each other. In the immediate aftermath, over 2 million East Germans crossed into West Berlin and West Germany, eager to experience the freedoms and opportunities that had been denied to them for so long. But while the scenes of celebrations dominated headlines, there were significant challenges ahead. The influx of people from the East strained the infrastructure and economy of West Germany, there were long lines for housing, jobs and welfare benefits and the gap between the prosperous West and the struggling East became immediately apparent. Many East Germans were overwhelmed by the rapid changes, finding themselves in a new world where they had to quickly adapt to a market economy. Meanwhile, 
political leaders were scrambling to manage the reunification process. Chancellor Helmut Kohl moved quickly, proposing a 10-point plan to reunify Germany, but the process would require delicate negotiations with the Soviet Union, the United States, and other European powers. The fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, marked the beginning of the end for not only the division of Germany, but the Cold War itself. It was a moment that symbolized the triumph of freedom over oppression and the power of people to demand change in the face of tyranny. But Wall's legacy lives on. In today's Berlin, sections of the Wall remain as reminders of a divided past. The East Side Gallery, a 1.3 kilometer stretch of the Wall, is now covered in colorful murals, once a symbol of oppression, now a canvas for peace, freedom, and unity. Other parts of the wall are preserved as solemn memorials. Visitors to the Berlin Wall Memorial are reminded of the human cost of division, those who risked everything for a taste of freedom, and those who lost their lives trying to cross from east to west. These remnants serve not only as historical markers, but as warnings for future generations. Walls may divide us physically, but the human spirit cannot be contained for long. The wall fell because of the collective will of those who refused to live in a world of division. Today, Berlin is a city transformed. Where the wall once stood, there are now parks, memorials, and bustling streets, proof of the resilience of the human spirit. Every year, on October 3rd, Germany celebrates Tag der Deutschen Einheit, German Unity Day, a national holiday commemorating the country's reunification. But it's not just a celebration for Germans, it's a celebration for all who believe in the power of hope, democracy, and the fundamental right of all people to live in freedom. The wall fell because of the courage of ordinary citizens, and it remains a testament to the enduring human desire for freedom. The story of the Berlin Wall is not just a part of German history, it is a part of world history, a reminder that the fight for freedom and dignity is universal. But now, I'd like to know what's your take on all this. Let me know what you think about this pivotal moment in the comments downstairs. Don't forget to subscribe for more stories about the major chapters of history. If you like what you saw, perhaps you might want to visit my Patreon page. I do want to thank my long-standing patrons Dan and Lawrence Neal for being my friends for years now. In the meantime, I do hope to see you next time. Bye.